in your Bibles, turn to Titus chapter 3, as we're going through um, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, looking at um, the information that Paul is giving um, to these church leaders, Timothy and Titus, to be able to teach the church, um, to be able to bring guidance um, in the life of the church. We're trying to do that as we go through it to see um, what's the message for us as we follow Christ. Um, Titus chapter 3, coming to the end of this letter, verses uh, 8 through 11. Titus 3, 8 through 11. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want to speak confidently. I, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject the factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. So Paul is talking about some issues going on in the church. I'm not sure all the things. We've looked at some of the false teaching that might have been going on. But obviously there are people within the church that are getting caught up in all these like peripheral things that really aren't the focus of truly following Christ, but just something to argue about. And, and it's easy to do that. It's, it's easy to get caught up in these different doctrines or ideas and something you might read one thing about in Scripture and, and people come up with all sorts of ideas of what that might mean or you know, what that might entail. Um, you know, so if you, you know, you, those things can happen, and it's very easy to get caught up in arguing and discussing and controversies instead of really focusing on following God in, in our lives. And, and that's what we're called to do. And that's why God has given us his word. That's why we have the Holy Spirit within us, so that we can follow God in our lives. We've been talking about doing this, running this race of perseverance. We recognize that as we come to Christ, we put our faith in Christ, that um, we are beginning this race. And it is a race for the rest of our lives. And uh, someday when our life ends, whether it's through the return of Christ or the end of our life on earth, that um, we will finally cross that finish line. And, and it's, 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 I'm thankful to know that Scripture shows us it's about all of us crossing that finish line. It's not about just the first or second one to get across, but all of us who stay faithful and following the Lord, we get to cross that finish line and, and experience the joy of that in our lives. And so uh, as we think about that, uh, we, we need to recognize that, you know, there, it comes to, there needs to be a focus, so a focus of what we're trying to accomplish as we follow the Lord. And Paul has been writing about those things um, in these scriptures. Now, he talks about avoiding foolish controversies and disputes and all this, this sort of stuff. And, and that's what we can do. We can look at, I'm, I'm just trying to cross that finish line. I'm trying to um, live this fruitful life for the Lord. Now, one of the things that we've done as we've been able to um, go through these letters of, uh, as we've gone through 1 Timothy and now um, finishing up with Titus, as we've been looking at some, uh, you know, using this theme, we've been looking at some ideas and, and pictures, illustrations of, you know, running, you know, of, of sports, of exercise. We've been, you know, I've talked about that. And even as I, as I think about that in, in our lives, if you are a runner or a jogger, one of the things that, that you might see is that we just get inundated uh, from the world around us on all these different ideas about running and jogging. I mean, if you start getting emails from groups and uh, maybe buy a book here or, or see a video there, that, that all of a sudden, you know, these these things start showing up that, oh, if you do this, you'll run faster. And if you do this, your, your stride will be better or your form will be better. And then I just did a quick search and came up with all these you know, websites that um, talk about, oh, you need to do these things to run faster, or, or somebody's gonna give you 15 other things, or four different things, or, or how many miles you should put in, and, and all this stuff. And, and if you're not careful, you'll just get paralyzed by all the stuff and, and not do anything, or just you know, finally just say, look, I'm just, I'm just trying to exercise you know, here, and I'm just trying to just do it as best I can, get this exercise, and, and, uh, and move on. But so in, in whatever you do, it's easy to get kind of caught up in all these different ideas, these different angles, different thoughts, different arguments, all of this, whether it's in exercise or running, 
within the church, thinking about the Bible, whether it's in the world, whether it's things that um, you talk about, maybe something at work. I mean, it's easy. Whatever the topic, you can, you know, there are plenty of people that can argue and come up with different controversies about that particular topic. And even as I talk about running, one of the things I recognize is that, boy, not everybody's into it, right? And so, uh, you know, I might be excited to talk about it, but I'm only going to talk about it so much with people. But, uh, you know, but, you know, you, you learn after a while that, hey, not everybody is into it. They don't want to do it. You know, a lot of people exercise, but they're not going to run. And, and that's great. And so when you, when you think about that, even in your Christian faith, you get kind of caught up in this one little thing that you've read in Scripture, and you really want to talk all about it. Not everybody's into it. You know, we're, we need to focus on, you know, what's, what's real as far as, you know, putting our faith in Christ and living that life for Christ and not getting caught up in all these other things. So as I was thinking about this idea, um, I remembered a video that, um, that I had that talks about a non-runner giving his take on running to kind of balance out some of the stuff. I don't get jogging. I've tried it. I wasn't very good. I'd run a mile, buy half a dozen donuts, and then walk home. <laughs> I ran every day for a month and a half and gained 21 pounds. So. I don't care what your doctor tells you. That jogging will pack on the flab, man. So a friend of mine said your problem is uh, you don't understand. You have a lack of information. If you understood it more, you'd enjoy it more. He bought me a book on jogging. They write books on how to jog. How intellectually deprived do you have to be to not figure out how to jog? Where do you run into problems? Oh, gee, I'm skipping again. You know, honey, there's a lot more to this jogging than meets the eye. Are there people in America so dense they see runners on the horizon? How do they do that? There's got to be a book. And the book is thick. It means they fill it with information you'll never use. One chapter, one whole chapter devoted to how to train for a marathon. I read the first line and looked at my wife and said, like, uh, we'll ever live 26 miles from a donut shop. So as a runner, I recognize not everybody's into it. And that's fine. Um, and then we need to make sure that in our lives as we follow Christ, if we kind of get caught up in one of these other things, I'm not talking about you know, getting caught up in Jesus, but some of these other teachings, some of these other ideas that, that Scripture talks about, but maybe doesn't get, have a lot of detail about, if we just get kind of caught up in those things, then instead of just focusing on Jesus, then people may not be all that interested and, and, and definitely may not want to be involved with the arguments and the controversies that, that go with that. And so um, let's really focus on those things that are pleasing to the Lord. And so we need to think about that um, in our lives. We need, to look at the, we need to look at the basics. And Paul gives those basics to, um, to Titus to give to the church. We are saved by grace. It's the grace of God that we are saved. Jesus did all the work, and we have received the blessing of receiving that work from Christ. It's the, by grace you've been saved. We recognize that. And Paul also points out in Titus that the grace of God gives us the, uh, the power to be able to live that righteous life. And so we have that, that ability through God's grace and his spirit within us to, to live that life of godliness. And then we go from there and say, so what does God want from me now? And you notice here, as we're finishing up Titus, that Paul keeps talking about doing these good deeds and, and doing these things for the Lord. And God wants us to live a fruitful life. We see that all through Scripture, that once, that once we get into his family, not to become part of his family, but once we get into his family, then what's pleasing to God is that we, leave, that we live this fruitful life. So let's take a look at that today and ask that question, so how do we do that? How do we live this fruitful life? First of all, we do what is important to God. If we're going to live that fruitful life, we have to examine the things that we do, and we have to ask that question, is this really important to God? 
Again, you know, those, the, some of the controversies of, of what people study in Scripture and, and what people get caught up on, you know, you even have to ask, is that really important to God? Maybe even some of the things that we really want to do as a church and, and think, oh, you know, we've done this and we want to do this again. We have to ask that question. Is that really important to God? The things that we are involved in in our lives, the decisions that we make, the activities that we want to participate in our lives, we need to ask that question. Is this really important to God? And we've looked at that. We've talked about how the, there are things that you do in life that are going to have eternal value and obviously very important to God. And there are going to be things in life that just really have no eternal value. Now, it might be important to God because you're involved with that, because you're important to God, but we have to balance that. We have to look at that, that and say, you know, am I living this life that's fruitful for the Lord? Am I asking that question, is this important to God? In John chapter 4, Jesus was with his disciples, and um, they were going through Samaria, and, and they had Jesus just stay by this well. They went on into town to, to get some food, and while they were in town, that woman came out. The woman at the well, we know her as, and, and um, they had that conversation. So they have this long conversation. She leaves to go tell others about Jesus, and his disciples come back, and um, they're ready to give Jesus something to eat and tell him that he needs to eat. And he had such an interesting answer to them um, after that. In John chapter 4, uh, verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus said, this is my goal. My whole goal in life is to do what my father wants me to do, to accomplish the work that that he wants me to accomplish. Obviously, he needed to eat, and, and he wasn't just going to live his whole life just doing the work as, you know, he had to eat and sleep and those things. But he's pointing out how important that is for him. And he used that, just that illustration of, hey, you need something to eat by saying, that's my food. That's my nourishment. That's what I'm going to do in life. That's what's important to me, that I do uh, what is important to God. And we need to ask our question, that question. When's the last time we've asked that question? You know, with, with ourselves, is this really important to God? Or do we just go about and do what we want to do, what we, what we feel like we want, like to do? I think if we're going to live this fruitful life, if we're going to live, you know, a, a court, that life that's pleasing to God, then that is a question that we need to ask. Secondly, to help you live that fruitful life, um, we need to find out that Scripture shows us that we need to meet the needs of people around us. That's part of living that fruitful life. That's, that's the whole point of these good deeds. You know, when he says, I want you to, to do these good deeds. Now, remember, it's not for salvation. It's a result of our salvation, living that life that's pleasing to God and has a positive effect on other people's lives. And he says, uh, and, and we see Jesus doing that. We see the apostles doing that. We see uh, the early Christians doing that. Were there, they were concerned about the needs of the people around them. Now, let me make sure we understand the context of what, we've, what we're talking about here. Um, we're talking about the body of Christ. That's what, that's what Paul is talking about uh, with, with Titus here. Now, there are, there, are, there, are me, there are needs in the community, and we need to reach out and meet those needs. But, the, but the, where it really talks in Scripture about taking care of your brother's needs, taking care of your sister's needs, uh, that's going to be within the context of the body of Christ so that we can encourage one another. That's part of what fellowship is all about. And it might be an emotional need. It might be a spiritual need. It might be a physical need. It could be all sorts of things where we're just standing there encouraging one another. Um, but we are there to help one another together as we are moving forward um, as we're racing this race of faith with perseverance. In verse 13, Paul tells Titus to help some brothers in Christ in their ministry. Help them out, uh, support them, assist them. And that's what we try to do within, within the church. Then in verse 14, he says, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. That's what we're, that's what we're called to do as the church is to meet those needs that are around us, that, that we think about it. Not just, oh, I, I need to go to church and go back home, or I need to go to this Bible study and go back home, but to be involved in the lives of people within the body of Christ so that we can really help one another. That's what we are called to do, to meet those pressing needs. When we meet pressing needs, when we are focused on that, 
it's going to put our faith in practice. We're going to all of a sudden recognize um, that God has some things that we can do, and, and he has, he's given us opportunities to help people that are around us. And when we do that, then all of a sudden we're not just focused on ourselves and our own needs or our own desires or the things that we, the things that we want to be involved with, but we all of a sudden we have that outward focus as God has. A very simple life, a simple life of living for God, trying to please God, doing what's important to him, seeing the needs that are around us, being aware of that, and, and having that willingness to be able to meet those needs that are around us. That's, that's what it means to live that fruitful life. Um, part of that is meeting those needs that are around you. And thirdly, to strive for unity. We need, to, we need to really focus on this idea of unity because here in this passage of Scripture, you notice Paul keeps talking about these controversies and these strifes and these problems that are happening that people are bringing up. Somebody in the church is doing this that, that he's dealing with and he's giving Titus the information on how to, how to take care of that problem. Um, and what happened back then will continue happening today because that's just... That's one of the probably attacks against a church is if you can, you know, if somehow people can get caught up in arguments and controversies and things like that, then we lose focus of what we're supposed to do of following the Lord and doing his will and living that fruitful life. And so Paul encourages unity. He says, let's show some love. And, and he talks about this patience and um, encouragement and unity. Way back at the beginning of the chapter, Paul talks about being subject to rulers and authorities. So there are, there are, there are authorities in our lives that, that we need to make sure that we are subject, we are uh, submissive to them. He says to be peaceable and considerate to others, showing true humility. And that's, that's an opportunity for us to respond to people and ideas and all that of just... of not getting caught up in all of that and not trying to argue necessarily about all those things, but focusing on what does it mean to put our faith in Jesus? What does it mean to live for him? And, and, and showing peace and humility as opposed to of controversy and arguments. Um, he reminds the church um, that before they came to Christ, they lived in malice and envy and hate. He says, you've come out of that. You've left all that. Don't bring it back into the church. Uh, you've left those things, and so let's, let's follow Christ and let's live that fruitful life. Um, and then he finishes up this letter by telling them to greet those who love us in the faith, brothers and sisters in Christ who are working together um, with Paul in different areas. Um, he says to show that love to them in our lives. We have, we're going we're gonna to push for something. We're going to something, you know, we're going to decide things are important. Hopefully it matches what, what God says is important. Um, and one of the things that we need to look at as far as importance is unity and a focus on those eternal things in life, those things that focus us back on Jesus and what he's done for us and that life that we live through him. We run this race of faith with perseverance. And as we go through this, you know, we, if it's on a track, you might be able to see the finish line. Uh, but it's this, it's this long race, maybe meandering through our lives. As we're going on this race, you, you recognize, boy, that finish line's a long way out there. And if, and if you do an endurance race, then you recognize it. Yeah, that, I'm out here running, but that finish line is long, a long ways away. And so what do you do? You can't see it. And so you just say, well, I know what I need to do next. I need to take one more step and take another step and continue doing this. And so in our lives, we need to do the same thing as we follow Christ. We know that finish line is probably a long ways out there. And so we just take that step, asking that question. Is this important to God? Taking that step, asking that question. Am I meeting somebody else's needs? Taking that step, asking that question. Am I, am I serious about unity within the body of Christ? Or am I caught up in strife and division and dissension? Uh, am I, or am I concerned about the witness of the church, that we can be a witness in this world around us? We have the opportunity, as we take those steps, to live that fruitful life. And that's how we will bear fruit, by doing those good deeds because we're focused on Christ, 
focusing on what he has done for us. Let's remove those distractions. Let's remove those controversies and arguments. And let's focus on Jesus and what he's done. And let's live for him. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for um, this opportunity as we open your word and uh, come together and worship you. I pray, Father, that you would just continue to lead us and guide us. I pray, Father, that as we, as we uh, seek you, that um, we know that uh, we would live that life that's pleasing to you. Help us to see what you think is important, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.